I, I think by 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 the, this government's actions and by the uh, action of the uh, Security Council, uh, it is clear that both our country and, and the UN uh, have opted for prosecution, uh, and uh, they're willing to take the risk that somehow these prosecutions might exacerbate tensions. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. I, I, it is a, these are these are difficult questions for which there are no simple answers. Uh, I'm happy to say that at the Justice Department we have provided an enormous amount of support to the uh, staff at the Hague Tribunal. Uh, quite a number of my colleagues uh, in the department are actually stationed in the Hague now at U.S. government expense uh, working on the prosecutions. Uh, I had the uh, Chief Judge, uh, Judge Cassese, in, in my office uh, last year, and he was very interested in some of our precedents, and we gave him a, a lot of written material uh, that he could take back to the Hague. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I guess what I'm a asking has nothing to do with uh, the questions that came before. Identify uh, yourself, please. Oh, Annie Logan Lyon. My, I was a reporter at Nuremberg, and my husband was a prosecutor there. Uh, I'm still a reporter, so, uh, uh, for the New Yorker magazine. Uh, I once asked uh, the one of the officials who was in charge of getting started a New York Holocaust Museum, New York City. And he, I said, are you going to make room for the, there were, as I understood it, 12 million people who died in the Holocaust and 6 million of them were Jews. Are you going to make room for the other six? And he said, after a while, no. He said, I'm doing this for my great uncle who died in camps, and uh, we'll see what other groups want to do. Well, the New York the New York Museum is now known as the Jewish Museum, the Holocaust Museum for Jewish Heritage. So I think that fight apparently has sort of been lost. But uh, yesterday, yesterday evening, uh, we were asked twice, the people here, to make witness about our relatives who, who might have been uh, lost in the, in the Jewish Holocaust, or, and by, once by the person from Shoah. And uh, I think there was an impression, I got the impression, that most people at Nuremberg went to Nuremberg because of their concern over what had happened to the Jews. I think, one, for one thing, the people who, who had lost people in the Holocaust were probably still, so many of them, still in shock about what had happened. But in fact, it, uh, it was a very wide, uh, it was a, a group at Nuremberg from all uh, countries that was very uh, uh, diverse in uh, mid Midwestern America, many of them. Uh, not particularly Jewish. And I think, I li I'd really like it to be remembered uh, that uh, the justice that was being celebrated is for all people, uh, who some of them, uh, we, we, you don't ever want to take away the horror of what was done to the Jewish race, which suffered most. Maybe I could make a comment on that and then the Certainly. members of the panel. Yeah. In my three or four years as a member of the Holocaust Council, this topic came up quite often. Mm -hmm. And no one uh, was going to deny or diminish what uh, Christians had suffered. Mm -hmm. But that if the feeling was that the genocide, uh, the crimes against humanity, were more against the Jews than the Gentiles. The Gentiles were killed because they were inconvenient, or they were on the wrong side, or it was just a mere atrocity. Sometimes those things happen in a war. But I think the consensus was, without demeaning, without diminishing the sufferings of the other six million people, that the world should remember that the Holocaust of the Jews was 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 genocide. And I think that's the prevailing feeling among some Christians, particularly among Jesuits. Many Jesuits were killed and slaughtered in Poland and in Germany. Uh, we have the feeling that maybe we should remember them more. But uh, to repeat, I don't think anybody anything should diminish. Uh, what happened in the Holocaust of the Jews? Maybe the panel would watch yes. Well, I discourage you. Because uh, gypsies, of course, were not Jews. 
they were Christians and they had Jesus. And they were still alive just because of the real genocide. So well, I, may I also, may I, I'm a Quaker, the, the, the religious people died, but not the religious people. And when Jesus died, they were still alive. And they were simply detested Hitler and, and the communists and the gays. And I don't mean that anything should be diminished. What comments did you say to those who suffer most, those who have suffered most? But it seems that the other should also be, I think, included. I remember, I was at Nuremberg the night that, uh, of, of, of the hanging of, of, the, of the defendants in the first trial. And Julius Stryker, whom you may remember, uh, oh. as, he, as he was hanged, he found his firm festival. Look at this as a, as a Jewish festival, Nuremberg, that is, the, 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 the verdict. And I really would, when I would think of Nuremberg as having to do with justice for all different kinds of people, including, in major form, the Jews, but also all these other people who also suffered. The, 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 uh, after the war, the uh, German government tried to get uh, uh, an exhibit going in Munich of people who had protested Hitler during the time of, of, uh, of his reign, and they couldn't find any documents of people who had spoken out which one could understand, except the Jehovah's Witnesses, who had suffered terribly also. So um, I just would like to make that suggestion. That uh, thank you. I wonder if Dr. Johnson would want to comment. Um, I, I, I'd almost like to return to um, how Michael Berenbaum uh, tries to envision this and how the museum, and tomorrow many of you will get to, to go through the exhibit and see this, to see how he thinks, or how the museum has thought about it. Jews being, of course, the victims we know most about because of the propaganda and because of the, the coverage and so forth, but the many other groups that were also victims not only racial victims, but political victims and religious victims, as you mentioned, almost in, in terms of concentric circles. And points out, once one group, like the Jews, has become vulnerable, singled out in, in the press like that, it's possible that it can trickle out to all groups. And uh, I think that's a, one way to work with trying to get some of this balance in there. We need to know the specific of what happened to Jews but also to see the other groups there and to find some way to look at that without having and without falling into the trap of comparative pain or suffering, which is well, also I don't a problem. Well, I want to do that because the, the, after all, the, apparently the Egyptians suffered first in, in, in some cases. Right. So I, just, right. just, I, know, I know someone said to me, oh, oh don't bring that up. Uh, uh, everybody knows that uh, there are other groups. Uh, I'm not sure everyone does, uh, and I think the Holocaust... Let's have Eli comment on it, and then we'll get on to another issue. Yes. So just uh, real quickly, uh, I, I think it's fair to say that the uh, crimes against uh, Jews were not the principal focus of the Nuremberg trials. Uh, the, first, the first major proceeding, uh, well, that's, that's certainly in the Einstein's group of case it was. Uh, but um, uh, overall, at Nuremberg, uh, that was not the principal focus, and it's clearly the case that Jews were a minority of the staff at Nuremberg, as, by the way, they are a, mi a minority of, uh, of my office. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I was working at Nuremberg to all the research this, and I belong to the remnants of the Russian aristocracy. And while I was in Nuremberg, I got an SOS from my uncle and his family who were slave laborers. Would you step back from the mic just a bit, sir? My uncle and his family were slave laborers. They had a sign here put by the German Nazis, Ost, O-S-T, Eastern Slave. And uh, the American government, together with the British government, while we were judging the Nazis, all Russian anti-communists were turned over to Stalin to be executed. In fact, uh, my uncle was a UNRWA, UN, UNRWA uh, camp, and he heard rumors that the American army is going to, by force, turn them over to our ally Stalin, who killed 50 million Russians. And uh, he hid in the forest, and he saw next day 
trucks and the American MPs forcefully taking the Russians to the Soviet zone. And many Russians wanted to cut their wrists and commit suicide, but our medics fixed them up. After all, they had to get a life to start it. So my uncle was hiding in the, with a German family in Munich. I was able to come from Nuremberg to see him and his family for the first time in my life. And I was able to write a letter to Eisenhower that not all the Russians are communists. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, later on I read a book that two million, two million Russian anti-communists, even those who fled from the Russian Revolution, like General Krasnov, uh, who has never lived in the Soviet Union, were turned over by the British to be executed. He was hanged in the Red Square together with his son. And these crimes were committed while we were judging the Nazis. I would like to thank you very much for your comments, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Everybody knows this young fellow here, Mr. Lorenz. I'd like to just comment very briefly on the uh, theme that was uh, uh, raised by Andy Logan. Um, I think it uh, is certainly correct that she makes the argument Nuremberg should not be viewed as having been primarily concerned with the extermination of one particular group. And we were not. The whole concept of crimes against humanity, which is articulated and sort of codified in Nuremberg, spoke about crimes against humanity and not about any particular group. When Pope John Paul, if I may include it to your field for a moment, <laughs> addressed the United Nations uh, recently, he spoke about the whole human family. And I think that is the correct approach to prosecution of uh, war crimes and related offenses like aggression and crimes against humanity. And that is, in fact, what we are doing as we urge the continuation and strengthening of the ad hoc tribunals for Yugoslavia and Rwanda. There were no Jews killed in Rwanda. And we are all equally agitated about that. And in our pursuit of a permanent international criminal court, concerned with the welfare of all human beings in the future, certainly, we should follow our lead, and we are already doing that, in stressing again the needs of the entire human family to live in peace and dignity. Well, thank you. Well, let me just add that in, in South Africa, they now have a new commission on reconciliation, uh, headed by Archbishop Tutu, and they are seeking to get the crimes and report the atrocities done by white people over a long period of time. And that if sometimes you get discouraged about Nuremberg and is the idea still with us, look at what is happening in the individual countries. I have talked with people in Chile who are in still investigating the crimes done in the Pinochet regime. And unfortunately, it's all over apparently in Argentina, but they did send some generals to jail on the principle of accountability. And likewise in uh, El Salvador, the Jesuit, the, the people who killed the Jesuits were sent to jail, although then they gave amnesty and they're back on the streets now. And in the Philippines, this idea is still going. What can we do to get at the atrocities and the crimes against humanity done in the Marcos regime? Yes, sir. A uh, quick question, uh, Don Cooper. Uh, is it practical to set up a newsletter which could be distributed at, uh, I don't know, uh, 15, 25 dollars uh, a year uh, using this group as a nucleus of uh, uh, distribution list, uh, we have picked up here a lot of information, but we're going to lose that information when we get back home. We are scattered all over the country. The newspapers, the periodicals, TV, don't pick up all this information, the kind that we're getting here today. Is there some way that we can have a continuing flow of the kind of information we must have if we're going to help carry on the, uh, uh, the, the Nuremberg principle. Sir, I hope that you find a way. I teach a course on international human rights at Georgetown Law School, and all of this has never been heard of by the students, and you know, they're two generations away. And any newsletter or internet or some way to tell them about what you people did and the ongoing issues would be good. It should it'd probably be tied into the new tribunal of Rwanda and uh, give a systematic way by which an index set of information can be available. I think it's a very good idea. Uh, yes, sir. 
Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sister. Yes, sister. Yes, sister. Yes, sister. Yes, sister. I'm Hilda Roberts. My husband was a prosecutor, and I was in charge of the food service at Nuremberg. I'm very pragmatic about this business of carrying on uh, what we want to see carried on for the current atrocities. And in that sense, it's going to be whether or not our Congress appropriates enough money to the Justice Department or wherever this goes. So I would suggest none of us are timid, and there are not going to be very many people who are writing their congressmen and senators and saying, finance the whatever it's called by the time it gets into a legislative form. Lobbying is one of the best things that we in this country have. Now, Father Ryan and I'm sure is pretty well aware of that. And I have lobbied Congress on various subjects for all of my life since I came back from, from Nuremberg. And I'll just mention this, that one of the things I've done primarily from, since Nuremberg is work in the field of mental health. And I think very few people realize that the first concentration camp that was set up in Germany, long before they started picking up uh, any of the, the Jews or others, was for the mentally ill and the mentally retarded. These people, the Hitler didn't want any of this, uh, these people reproducing. And the World Health Organization, part of the UN, picked up on this particular thing and has this well documented. They asked the World Federation for Mental Health, which I was an officer at that time, to carry this. And they have, we have gotten through the Security Council, not just civil rights and human rights of all human beings, but particularly the human rights of people who have a mental disability. I just think I'd share that. Yeah, uh, if I could just uh, sound a variation on, on Mrs. Robbins' theme. There are, of course, lots of people writing Congress on lots of different issues, lots of people lobbying. What they don't hear very often is someone writing a letter saying, uh, I was on the staff at Nuremberg. They don't meet people who work at Nuremberg. They will no doubt have the same goosebumps that people of, uh, of, of, in, in my field get, in my generation, when they meet you. You people have an almost unique moral authority when you address these, these issues, and it's extraordinarily powerful. So without getting into the specifics of, of what the issues are and what positions you would take, uh, I would encourage you to use the, this extraordinary moral authority that you have. I, I, think, I think that's an excellent idea, and when I was in Congress for 10 years, I did hear from a few of you people, a few of them were in my district, and that uh, he is entirely right that you have a moral authority. That's why I want to see you people perpetuate your voice some institutionalized way by which we could have all the accumulated wisdom of the people in this room. I was very impressed a year or so ago at Boston College Law School with what uh, uh, was just said, the moral authority that you people have. And uh, to repeat, I want, I think the world needs an institutionalized way by which your voice will continue. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm Hetty Epstein. I was a research analyst working primarily on the medical trial. Uh, and just before taking the microphone, I assured Ben Perens that unlike yesterday, I will not ask a controversial question. <laughs> um, my question You're is... You're going to ask about basketball and whether Georgetown will win. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know much about basketball. Um, you better know it this time, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> my, my question is to Dr. Johnson. Uh, I frequently speak to middle school, high school, college students, and other organizations um, about my, my Holocaust-related experience, but also about my experience at Nuremberg. And I was um, wondering if you had any material that would, could help me in my presentation. Um, we do have some materials um, uh, that, along the lines of what I talked about before, that I've been putting together. And uh, afterwards, I'll, I'll show you what I what I do have that you can look at. And I'm, I'm not a teacher. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what we need. We need stuff that people can use and not feel that they can't touch. I mean, on the one hand, there's the moral authority and and something incredible, as Eli keeps talking about about touching Nuremberg, but we can't be afraid to touch it too. And that's what we need material to help with. So thank you. Yes, ma'am. 
My name is Vivian Spitz. I was, I am from Denver, and I was a court reporter on the medical case and subsequent cases. And I would like to let Dr. Johnson and all of you know that education about the Holocaust is alive and well in Colorado. The University of Denver, since 1990, has had in their Center for Judaic Studies developed a bibliography to present to all levels of school children from middle school through college on the Holocaust. Since I retired as chief reporter in the United States House of Representatives, and we reported Father Trinan, and uh, now uh, Senator Dodd, because of the denial of the Holocaust, I decided 10 years ago that I would put together a presentation to present to the schools on my experiences in Nuremberg and on the medical case. I have geared it to a level that middle school children can understand in Colorado before I present to them, they must have read not only the diary of Anne Frank, but also other literature which has been compiled for these children to read. And I have found that the middle school students are the most interested <coughs> students. I want you to know that in the past two years, I have made presentations 79 times. I include 30 slides of Nuremberg, of the medical experiments, and I know how important the visual aspect is. When I leave here Sunday, I am going to Dallas, to Lexington, to Miami, and back to Denver. In the next 30 days, I will reach more than 3,000 students. Let me follow up on that comment and say that I take uh, students from Georgetown Law School to the Holocaust Memorial on a regular basis, 20 or 30, and uh, they can hardly talk after the two hours there. And that I don't uh, ask them to make comments, it's just so uh, ineffable. And that their comments will come maybe two or three days after that. They're suddenly recovered from this, they hadn't known. And quietly they go with other people to visit it on a Saturday morning. And uh, that's one of the uh, wonderful thing that this memorial does, and they're doing a very good job in reaching out to people. Before we have to close in a couple of minutes, let me express the regrets of Professor Diane Oren Licker, who was scheduled to be with us and simply could. Something very important came up at the last moment. She felt very bad about that. She is an expert on international human rights. She's written extensively in the Yale Law Journal and also, and that I hope that on another occasion you will have the benefit of her wisdom. She would have given us a focus namely pointing out how internationally recognized human rights are now all around the world, the covenants of the United Nations, even the United States is ratifying more and more of the covenants, and that frankly is a direct outcome of what you people did in Nuremberg. Uh, yes, sir. My name is Lawrence Ray, and as I mentioned before, I worked in, in, uh, in uh, photographic <coughs> evidence during the trials. In Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, we have a TV station, KNNE TV, Channel 5, an educational channel, and it made a documentary of the atrocities that I was able to collect during the Nuremberg trials. And each year, for 10 years now, I have been going to the schools in 
Albuquerque and surrounding areas and presented a lecture that includes a 30 minute showing of the actual atrocity pictures. And if I may say, it, the reaction to it are just unbelievable. There is not a word being spoken. And uh, when I come back next week, I have two lectures to give in Gallup, New Mexico, which is about 150 miles away from Albuquerque. And uh, the pictures, as somebody pointed out earlier, are more than words can describe. If the kids see the, the broken bodies, a woman with a breast cut off, or similar ideas, men being decapitated. That says more than any of us can say in words. And thanks to KNME TV, this I can do, and I'm grateful. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Let me, we're a bit over time. Let me thank Professor Duma, Dr. Johnson, and Eli Rosenbaum, and all of you. And let me conclude by telling you an anecdote or a story that was very meaningful to me. Three or four years ago, the American Bar Association met in London. And one day it was advertised that there'd be a pilgrimage to the shrine where the Magna Carta was established on June 15, 1215, centuries ago. And I wasn't keen on going, but several people uh, invited me and Justice Brennan was going to talk. And it was one of the most moving experiences of my life because we heard the story how the barons had revolted against their leaders, how they had asserted in the Magna Carta the Bill of Rights for the first time. We take all of those for granted, but they were the first ones in the history of humanity to assert them, and now they are the core of Anglo-American law, yes, indeed, law all around the world. And that I am quite certain that hopefully soon there will be a memorial at Nuremberg for what you people have done and that for centuries to come, people will look back and all of humankind will say that at Nuremberg, you people established for the first time in the history of the human race, the accountability of nations, the idea that you can't say my superior require this, and the idea that there are crimes against humanity that are not merely punishable by national law, but by international law, and all of you have done that. Let me close simply by saying, that when I am with you and when I read about you, when I think about Nuremberg, all I can say is that we're infinitely grateful to the wisdom of Justice Jackson and to President Roosevelt, the people who dreamed of this great thing, and that it reminds me of something with which I'll close, that Solon said it very well, centuries before Christ, 2,500 years before the Christian era, Solon, the ancient Athenian jurist, said the following, that justice will not come until those who are not hurt feel just as indignant as those who are hurt. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a 15-minute break. 15-minute uh, break. Oh, all right, good. I'll be listening. The reunion is very important that a few more people have some chance. Uh, would you please? Would you please be quiet there? <laughs> give you a gavel there. Yeah. Um, it's important that a few more people have a chance to talk about some specific experience. And there's several who have um, told me that they have something. And I have a couple of cases I wanted to call on them. The first person I'd like to call on is Dr. David Smith, who is a dentist to the uh, uh, Prisoners at Nuremberg. Thank you. Tell a couple brief little things. So very, very brief. I was attached to the 68th 50th Internal Security Detachment at Nuremberg, which was responsible for the security of the courthouse and the prisoners. As such, I was responsible for maintaining uh, the whole health.
help of the, of the prisoners, the, the Nazi uh, prisoners, uh, on an emergency basis, that is to say anything which would include their attending the court sessions, I would uh, uh, take care of. And I'll just recount one event along that line. Uh, Goring called me down one, one day complaining that he had broken a front jacket uh, on his upper boot, and uh, would I replace it for him, insisting that, after all, how could he, Herman Goring, appear in court uh, in uh, this uh, condition? I had to inform him that, uh, is that better? Thank you. Uh, that uh, this was not an emergency and didn't qualify for any uh, special treatment. But he persisted and uh, insisted that he would write a letter for me to the manager of a factory that made plastic uh, filling materials. Uh, and I would go there and I would be able to repair his jacket. Again, I informed him that uh, this uh, what wouldn't do. But uh, in retrospect, uh, many years later, I was sorry I didn't get the letter to the factory because the Germans were way ahead of us in developing plastic filling materials. And even if I didn't fix his jacket, I probably would have been a much wealthier man than I am today. Sig Rabbler? Right here. Here's one of our interpreters in Nuremberg who did a lot of great work. I, I arrived in Newburgh in the summer of 49 for the pre-trial uh, interrogations before the IMT started. And I just want to recount one thing. We heard a little bit about the Woodall Hess. I'd like to recount an incident with Colonel Amen, who was uh, one of the chief uh, interrogators before the IMT started. Hess had, uh, had just returned, had just been returned from, from Scotland. And uh, he claimed that he had no memory whatsoever of what has happened uh, during the, the Nazi times. In fact, the only thing that he claimed that he remembered was the fact that he was married and had children because he said, I have pictures uh, in my, my wallet. Other than that, uh, he had absolutely claimed to have no recollection. Of course, this was not acceptable. And there was one incident where in the presence of some psychiatrists and psychologists and members of the prosecution from the various delegations, uh, he was brought up to an interrogation room and the light, a light was shining on him and Colonel Amen through me asked, would you like to see some films? And he said, that's all right, will you watch it? If it's interesting, he said, I will. Uh, then the lights went out uh, his face was illuminated, and then an edited version of uh, new German newsreels was shown, with Hess shown at the Reichsparteitag in Nuremberg, at rallies, at parades, and whereas before he had shown no emotion at all, as whenever his face came up, he would grip the edge of his chair, just, and you could see that, that he was very much affected by it. Then it, it was about 20 minutes of that. Then the lights went on, and uh, Colonel Amen and I asked, did you find that interesting? And uh, he said, yes, very interesting. Did you recognize anyone? He said, well, first, I was surprised to see myself in, in that situation. I was completely shocked by that. Did you recognize anyone else? He said, only names, because when I'm led out to the courtyard for exercise, and as I walk past the cells, I saw the same names that I heard now <laughs> on the nameplates of the cells. This was one of the incidents with Rudolf Hess. <laughs> Dr. Latimer, you had another little story that you wanted to tell, and I thought that was quite interesting. Oh, thank you, Drex. Uh, along the same lines of uh, things that happened with the prisoners, 
You know, the, the, the most despicable of all the prisoners was Stryker. And, uh, uh, but he was a dynamo. Uh, he, he was, every morning, he would get up uh, earlier than anybody, do an hour of calisthenics, splash himself with a pail of ice cold water, and really impress everybody with how vigorous he was. And uh, the other thing he was doing was studying English. He had a uh, pigeon English, but uh, he had a little book, and he was studying away each day. And uh, then after the, con after the, the uh, uh, convictions and the judgments, and when he only had two weeks to live, he kept right on with his studying. And Dr. Fleiger, the little German doctor that uh, uh, worked with us, uh, said to him, you know, Stryker, why are you continuing your studying your English uh, when you're not going to be able to use it? Uh, <laughs> and he said, oh, he said, you, on, you don't understand. He said, in heaven they speak English. <laughs> well, then uh, uh, Dr. Fleiger said, well, but what about if you go the other way? What if you go to hell? Well, he said, that's all right. I already know how to speak French. <laughs> Uh, is, is the, the young lady Aja Smith here? It has not been I asked this before. Um, Mr. Glennie, are you here? Uh, Mr. Cooper, did you have some something about the IMT records, right? Yeah, just very brief. For the younger people here, I think a word needs to be said about the 42 volume proceedings of the uh, major war crime criminals. And uh, uh, I think the important thing is that these were originally intended to be published in four languages, English, German, French, Russian, and uh, there were 10,000 volumes to be printed in each language. Well, that was a great idea up until the week before Christmas when uh, Major Polarak, editor of the Russian edition, uh, gave uh, Dr. Egbert and I uh, each a bottle of uh, good Russian vodka and we gave him uh, two boxes, two cartons of cigarettes, and uh, he went home to Moscow for the holidays. But he didn't come back. <laughs> so Dr. Egbert asked me to put a call through to see if we could find out what had happened to him. Well, I made three attempts to get through to Moscow, got nowhere, uh, and then we got word uh, sent down to us through the administration office that uh, from Berlin, that we were to make no more approaches. And uh, it was obvious that we were not going to get a Russian edition. So as far as I know, the Russian edition was never published, uh, although somebody told me today that Dr. that uh, 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 Polarak did write a book on his own, uh, and that he, uh, this uh, somebody here found a copy of it in a bookstore up in uh, New York City. I'm going to try to get a copy of that, see if I can find out, find out what happened to the Russian editor and the Russian edition. I just thought you'd like to know that. Uh, incidentally, uh, I think the proceedings are the base for a lot of what has followed since then. And I am happy to find out recently that there was a good distribution of those 52 copies, and they're available now in most of the law libraries. And then I heard today that they are now being put on, that they are on tape. So I'm glad to know that that is available for us from here on in. Thank you very much. While we're talking about the record, there is one thing I would like to say, which I think some of you do know. Uh, at the very end of the <coughs> trials in 48 and early 49, Fred Niebergall, whose wife, I believe, is here. Is Gwenny here? Gwenny, yeah. Gwenny is here. Uh, Fred Niebergall and I undertook to see that a large number of uh, Germans who were working there, as well as others, 
reproduced and ran the presses on almost a 24-hour basis in order to create sufficient copies of the total records of the trials so they could be sent to 13 universities in this country. And uh, somehow that hadn't been thought of before or it would have been done, uh, uh, should, should have been done earlier. Uh, not that uh, the trials had all been over for very long. They hadn't. The, the ministry's case had just been finished. But from then on, for several months, the presses ran as fast as they could in Nuremberg all day long and at night in order to reproduce these copies. Um, Mr. Rosenfield? Rosenthal. Mr. Rosenthal. <laughs> Perhaps it will be of interest to you to hear how I met Whitney Harris. It was on the very first day when I came to Nuremberg and Whitney Harris was very depressed because Whitney Harris had the task of writing the brief about the Gestapo. And he knew that there was one bad thing or many bad things about the Gestapo. And the baddest or the worst thing about it was that it was virtually impossible to find in any place in the literature any reference that uh, the Gestapo or the uh, ex the extermination commands that they had killed Jews. They had not done this. They had, all the documents said what really happened is we resettled them. They had the wonderful word of resettlement. And he said, do you think that we could get an answer to this peculiar problem in admission that resettlement is killing? And I have tomorrow Otto Ollendorf, and I would like to interview him and see whether we can get it out of him. And I've had nobody who was willing to interpret for me today, would you do it? And I said, delighted. And so we went next day there, we came into the room and there was an ordinary man sitting and it was Otto Ollendorf. He looked like any German official, ein Beamter. And, um, Whitney asked him the first question and said, to Mr. Ollendorf, you were in charge of one, one of the Einsatz commands. And he said, yes, I was. And an Einsatz command is one of those groups with the gas wagons who followed the German army and liquidated people. And he said, yes, yes, I was. And uh, uh, now you uh, wrote in your report, you resettled. Isn't that in effect that you killed them, that you gassed them? Oh, yes, she said, of course I did. That's the way it was. <laughs> so Whitney was pleased, and so was I, because I rendered a small service. And as the interview came to an end, Whitney said suddenly, Mr. Ollendorf, would you remember how many people you liquidated? And suddenly, for the first time, I saw it there was something like an impact on this man. He became flat. He, he was sort of nervous and shattering. There were sweat pearls on his upper lip and he, his color changed. And then he kind of got hold of himself and there came the astonishing answer. He said, you know, it is embarrassing what happens to your memory. I cannot really with any degree of certainty say whether it was 95,000 people or 194,000 people. <laughs> that was the interview. Oh. Is John Bull here? Yeah. <coughs> no. <coughs> John, I'm 
very glad to have you come up here in front of all these people because I think the maintenance of the library at Nuremberg uh, took a lot of work and it also is more important than a lot of people know. Would you tell us an interesting interesting? Well, um, what I really would like to talk about is about something that didn't happen at Nuremberg, but I can. Um, <laughs> the only thing that I remember uh, pleasantly is um, something that's not very important. It sh uh, throws no light on the dependence. It throws no light on the importance and the significance of the trial. Um, but um, at any rate, I was in the IG Farm team, on the IG Farm team, and uh, I had a crew of people, and we talked all day IG Farm for weeks, for months. And one day the devil got into me, and I don't know why, but when the telephone rang, instead of my usual greeting, I said, IG Farm Nuremberg Branch. <laughs> And at the other end of the wire was a Drexel. <laughs> and um, he sounded a little confused. <laughs> and I think he decided that he had not heard right. <laughs> at any rate, that was the end of that particular story. <laughs> Uh, is Beatrice, uh, Beatrice Johnson Arnson here? Here I am. Beatrice, could you come on up? <laughs> One of the interesting things about the subsequent trials is that we had some uh, women who were attorneys and who worked at that. And you were one of them, were you not? No, I was a secretary to a judge. Oh, I see. Uh, I'm sorry, there was another Beatrice Johnson. No. But <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about being a secretary to the judge. We, after all, we prosecutors don't know much about the judges. Well, we got Pam this morning. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we were pretty isolated, so I've learned more today than I had before. And uh, it was an interesting experience when I was there on the Flick trial, tribunal number four. We had in an interesting tribunal, uh, Judge Sears from New York, Judge Richmond from Indiana, Judge Christensen from Minnesota, and for a while we had Judge Dixon, but he was transferred to another tribunal. It was most interesting, and I enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Demetrius Markov here. I'm picking people who happen to be sitting in the back of the room for something. <laughs> <laughs> You were a research analyst, and you became a professor. Professor, yeah, at uh, University. There you go. Uh, one of the, uh, while I was uh, doing my uh, research work, um, I uh, found a uh, document, a German document, that was describing in detail how to make soap out of human be uh, bodies. And uh, the German document stated that you can't use the whole human body. You have to have a fresh body, chop off the head, and uh, on the next page I saw a photograph, which I will never forget in my life. It was uh, a pyramid of human heads dropping blood, and the assessment was smiling at the camera. Uh, um, I did see the soap that they produced, and they said that they couldn't, couldn't use it commercially because the human smell is so strong that no perfume can kill it. Another thing that I will never forget is uh, lampshades made out of human skin by the picture of Belson, Jose Koch. 
she was tried in Dachau, but we did have the evidence in Nuremberg. Uh, this is the one of the most things that I will never forget. Thank you. Howard Russell, I'm uh, I'll call you up a minute. <laughs> you. What, what did I do? Well, I'll uh, I'll lead you a little bit. Okay. Uh, Howard is father, as you know, was secretary general, head of the personnel division, and held many other jobs in Nuremberg. And he was a young man then, and among other things, you did a couple of interesting points that helped sustain the trial. And I thought you might just briefly tell how a young man like you then did something. Gee. <laughs> uh, I have no idea. Uh, uh, the um, uh, A thing that I have been reminded of uh, as I have been um, listening to all of these things is the fact that um, while I was um, uh, uh, working in the secretariat for a year and a half or so, uh, I had, uh, uh, I was getting towards the end of my time, I was about to return to the United States, when suddenly my father was um, uh, appointed the secretary general. And um, uh, I, I was reminded of this uh, very recently when uh, Steve Forbes uh, quoted his father as having said, uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with nepotism as long as you keep it in the family. <laughs> um, my father, however, took a totally different view, and he said, you know, if you don't get on that plane, I'm going to fire you. That's my first <laughs> official act. Uh, now, that wasn't much of a contribution to the trials, but that's the way it worked. <laughs> I also want to thank Howard, as I will thank others who've been on the committee. He's been working with Georgetown and other universities to get some of the students who sat in the back of the room at uh, several of the sessions. Uh, Jack Robbins, you want to uh, come up? Right there. Uh, sorry, I meant to get you before. Sorry, sir. Rex, I would like to remember one of the great judges that, uh, in the subsequent proceedings, Michael Masmano. He was, uh, he was uh, assigned to Nuremberg from the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, and he sat on a number of the subsequent proceeding trials. He was one of the judges in the Pole case and also in the Mills case. Masmano was, uh, he probably has more dissenting opinions in the Pennsylvania reporter than all the other judges put together. He was really quite a character. Uh, you remember, he sat on the bench. He always wore his naval uniform under the robes, and he would always make sure that the gold braid was showing when he was on the bench. He was quite a woman's ladies' man, too. He, he was known as, he was a good dancer. He was known as jumping and pumping with Mus Mono. He was, he was a very enthusiastic dancer. Um, and I remember that every time there was a break in the case, he would, uh, take off for Rome and come back with Italian chocolates for all of the ladies. Uh, my wife said earlier that uh, she mentioned that she was in charge of the food service at the cafeteria. She was, when we got to Nuremberg, uh, she went over as the, as a CAF2, which is the lowest file clerk that the government recognizes. They found out that she had majored in dietetics and put her in charge of the courthouse cafeteria at the age of 22. We, you remember we were all eating on uh, 
metal plate uh, trays when at the beginning, and uh, somehow she managed to. Well, I think her uh, head chef, and we had the best. Uh, I think she wants to tell us. You, you all know that we did a lot of, what shall we call it, creative negotiating with cigarettes and so forth. And one time, uh, the head chef came and said, Frau Robbins, are you going to inventory the sugar and the coffee anytime new and soon? I said, I don't think so. I didn't know I was supposed to, of course. <laughs> and, uh, so he, he said, uh, well, we'll see. I was complaining because I said, they have China at the Grand Hotel, but we have to eat off of these metal trays here. Somehow, since I didn't inventory the coffee and the sugar, about two weeks later, he had 1,500 complete sets of China. <laughs> and, and everyone in the courthouse thought the meals had improved tremendously. <laughs> and I didn't do a thing about it. I learned, though, that you don't always have to go through channels to get in. Not too long after that, I was talking to a colonel from Texas, and I said, I just wish I could get some fresh things, because we had just army things to work with out of the can. He said, well, you know, uh, I got a lot of fresh things out of the hospital. We're the only people who get them. He said, we don't need them now, because we don't have very many people in the hospital. And he said, if you want me to, I'll send them down to you. So I got some fresh fruit then, and we can have some salads on our nice china. <laughs> Uh, my name is Alan Dreyfus, and uh, I'm a correspondent. I was. I covered uh, the first trial and a bit of every one of the other trials. And I think a bit of levity probably is called for. So I'll just recall a couple of things. One is that we had, as you know, correspondents from all over the world. And they were the people who interpreted what you people had fashioned and what the judgments were going to bring to the world's public. My job, as I saw it, was to explain what was happening at Nuremberg to all of the American armed forces all over the world. And I took that as a very serious responsibility. I met many splendid colleagues from all over. I could name Rebecca West, Erica Mond, Walter Lippmann. There were just so many people of merit whose names sort of resound down through the annals of journalism. Some of them were given to pranks. One I can remember, a man named Vic Bernstein, who was with PM. And he found one day, interestingly enough, that he didn't have a good story. So he took his identification card and he pasted Rin Tin Tin's picture on it. <laughs> and of course, the aftermath was that he was just waved through by GIs who wanted to get home and really didn't care whether Vic Bernstein got in or not. But the next day, there was a big story, uh, a fairly big story in PM, about the lax security measures at Nuremberg. I won't go on much longer, but just to recall that we were billeted out at the Stein, out at Stein, the Father Castle, which was a, a schloss of gargantuan and probably horrific proportions. Uh, I recall that all the male journalists were in, uh, in, the, in the building, the schloss itself, and the ladies had an annex all to themselves. I remember some of the stories I'd heard about it, but one of the most charming was about Betty Knox, who worked for the Standard, the London Standard, and her roommate was a fabulous journalist from Poland named Halina Tomi Tomaszewska. And she was sophistication itself. 
She looked stunning in her uniforms. She had cigarette holders that would come around a corner for an hour before you'd see her coming smoking. She loved her work. She was dedicated, and she'd go back to the annex and do a splendid job, I'm sure, for all of the Polish readers. But all of a sudden, there were disturbances outside her window. The very assiduous, conscientious GIs of the First Division, most of whom wanted to be back in East Cupcake, Ohio, instead of standing guard there, they would walk up and down, guarding the annex, and they would emit foul language. So foul and so loud that eventually, Halina Tomiszewska felt constrained to go and see General Watson. <laughs> <laughs> and she went in, her cigarette went in for about five minutes first. <laughs> and I think, I think the, the general knew who was there. And in came this, this lovely woman. And she flicked an ash. And said, General, she said, things are terrible. He said, what's the matter, Tommy? She said, I know you are trying to save us and protect us, and your soldiers are all around, and we have had no trouble, but the noise, the language, the epithets, they keep us awake. They are so disturbing. They are terrible. I don't think I can have another night's sleep with those terrible three-letter words. And General Watson, who was an army, regular army man, said, what? She said, those terrible three-letter words all night. I wish they could go away. He said, Tommy, I've been in the Army. I'm a regular. He said, I've been in posts from Peg to Winnipeg and the Philippines and China and everywhere. And he said, I thought I knew all the bilge, but I've never heard a three-letter swear word. <laughs> And with her graceful hand, she said, Oh, General Watson, fog, F-O-G. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Simon First of all, I want to commemorate a woman lawyer, and that's Bessie Margolin, whom I'm sure the general will remember, who helped draft the indictment for the subsequent proceedings and later on became as the head of the litigation division of the Labor Department. I think she won more cases on the Supreme Court than, all, than any other woman at the time. But I did want to tell a story about uh, Lord Lawrence, Sir David Lawrence, the chief uh, judge of the trial. Uh, you may recall, those of you who were at the first trial, that the trial adjourned so we could go over to uh, the first Salzburg Festival. <coughs> and many of us went to see Zauberflöte. And we pulled all sorts of strings in order to be able to see how the Zauberflöte. Didn't see uh, Sir David there, and I saw him the next day in the street. And I said, Sir David, I didn't see you in the street. Where were you? Well, he was such a modest man, as you know. He said, I didn't get a ticket. <laughs> We're starting to invade the free time, but I do want to give a chance to a couple of people who would like to briefly uh, say something in the line of anything that you think Nuremberg's on the spot ought to say. Anybody? else that wants to say something? All right. Pastor Margaret? Okay. There you go. Until <laughs> oh, I get there. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> I was the uh, chief prosecutor of the hostage case. We had two field marshals. We had two field marshals. Uh, field marshals that enlist with the fifth ranking field marshal at the beginning of the war, and field marshals and bikes, and 12 four star generals. Uh, two were acquitted because they. Oh, what's that noise? Why am I doing that? Okay. Hold it down lower. Yeah, okay. Uh, two were acquitted. Uh, two were given sentences of life imprisonment. And the rest got various terms from 20 down to 10 years. This was the case that involved the hostage order that Hitler handed down in 1941 at the time of the invasion of Greece and Yugoslavia, that for every German soldier that was killed by the partisans, a hundred hostages would be killed, and for every German soldier wounded, 50 hostages. And they carried out that order with mathematical precision. Now the, the defense was, they, the, the uh, German field marshals boasted of honor but when they uh, uh, were involved in, in this trial, they told lies. Field Marshal uh, List said, uh, I never received the order. So he pulled out a copy of the order and said, Field Marshal, uh, look at the distribution list. Isn't that your unit there, uh, Army Group A? would turn white, yes. But I never passed that order down to the troops. Oh, I see. Did you ever get any reports that the uh, order was being carried out? No. Nope. So we would produce reports from various division commanders and at the uh, turn it over and, and say, uh, did you ever see that order uh, of that report, Jill Marsh? No. Well, would you turn to the last page there? Isn't that your initial indicating that you received that report? Yes, it was. But we did the best we could to tell the, uh, the uh, commanders under us not to carry it out. Ein Befehl is ein Befehl. An order is an order. And they talked about the superior orders, and you did not dare violate an order from Hitler. There were, of course, cases in which Hitler's order were violated, and they were not executed. They may have been relieved of their command, but not executed. In Yugoslavia, the partisans, uh, the Tito and the Mihailovich, the Serbs and the Croats were fighting among each other, uh, and they were killing more of each other than they were of Germans. And the Germans were caught in the middle. They had a difficult time. They made a terrible mistake in attempting to uh, carry out that order. Militarily, it was stupid, because what they did is by carrying out the, the hostage order, they, uh, the young men, in any community, went to the hills and joined the partisans. So they, they reaped the whirlwind uh, by, that, by that order. It got so that you would cast aside some of the reports for executions. In reprisal for an attack at Sarajevo, Sarajevo we have executed out of the hostage camp at Belgrade as follows. 50 German soldiers killed times 100 equal 5,000. 15 German soldiers wounded times 50 equal 750 total. It got so that we were looking for the highest numbers without appreciating it. It was deadening to think that you were dealing with human beings as numbers. It was a uh, 
an incredible experience. One, we, we had the problem of all the documentation, but how do we bring this kind of thing alive? There was a mass murder in the Greek village of the Labyrintha. The German soldiers under uh, three-star, four-star General Fellman, Helmut Fellman, Fellman, took over this village and in reprisal for an attack by Greek partisans, they took all the women and children and put them in a schoolhouse. And they gathered all the men in the public square. And a rocket went off. And the machine guns all around the circle killed the men. The schoolhouse was set afire. We found out we had uh, Yugoslav representatives and Greek representatives, representatives at the trial. We found out that there was a survivor of this mass murder at Calabria. So we went, we flew to, from, to Rome and to Athens, and they flew this, this uh, countryman, never been in a plane before, never been to Athens before, and we took him back to our trial. And he testified about this event, and he said, as the German soldiers went up and down the rows, administering the coup de grace, I pretended to be dead and I survived. When he was cross-examined, he was sitting here, the defendants were right opposite him, not more than 15 feet away. Felmy's attorney said to him, well, this is all very interesting. Do you have anything to prove what you've just testified to? He opened his shirt and he said, here is the bullet hole in my shirt. It was really, I guess, one of the most dramatic events uh, that I have ever experienced. The thing that, uh, I, gotta, I gotta lighten up a little bit. The German uh, generals would come in in the morning, 12 of them, and the German lawyers would come in, and there would be this handshaking that went on. Everybody, every German lawyer shook hands with every defendant. Mm -hmm. They would go out to lunch, and back after lunch, same thing. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I remember, there was a battalion of black uh, military police stationed in Nuremberg. And I can remember these, uh, two of these uh, black MPs uh, ushering the 12 field marshals and four-star generals out of the courtroom for lunch. And I remember one of them um, uh, tapping with his billy club, the rear end of Field Marshal Van List. And he said, Mark Schnell, Field Marshal, get going, Field Marshal. <laughs> now, I had two interesting experiences, and one was the interrogation of Gurren. Those of us who stayed on after the main trial ended had an opportunity to talk to the uh, principal defendants. I remember Fred Kaufman was the interpreter and he and I went to this very small interrogation room. There was a small table in front of us and Goering was brought in by two black MPs. He stood at attention, he clicked his heels, bowed from the waist, and waited for me. I was 27 years old. He waited for me to motion for him to sit down. Fred Kaufman said, Reichs Marshall, would you like a cigarette? Yeah, well, he's your doctor, sir. He said, Reichs Marshall, would you like to speak in German or English? Oh, English is okay, he said. So we had uh, an incredible 50-minute uh, discussion. Ostensibly, I was to ask him what he knew about the war in the southeast, uh, southeastern Europe. He didn't really know very much. But towards the end of the uh, hour, I said to him, Field Marshal, have you any idea where Martin Bormann might be? Now, I said this deliberately because when the Allied air attacks in Berlin in 1943 uh, did a lot of devastation, 
Goering really fell out of Hitler's grace because originally he had said, if there's ever an enemy plane flying over Berlin, my name is Schwartz. <laughs> and Martin Bormann succeeded in, uh, in favor with, uh, of Hitler. But Martin Bormann disappeared and uh, was tried in an absentia. And periodically there would be reports, oh, I spotted him in the Alps or somewhere else, South America. So I deliberately asked Bormann because Goering, Goering didn't like Bormann, and I guess the, the, uh, the feeling was mutual. And I said, have you any idea where Martin Bormann might be? Ah, yes, he said. You know, he said, Martin was always kind of a left-wing Nazi. <laughs> ah, I say, and uh, where do you think he might be? Reichs Marshall. Oh, he said, I'm satisfied that he's with Franco in Spain. And this was very interesting. Went back, uh, told Telford, and the next day, somebody else went down. Kind of got the field, uh, field marshal, or uh, Reichs Marshall, down to the same uh, discussion. Where's Martin Borman? Ah, he's with Perón in Argentina. <laughs> now, the third day, uh, where did he have him the third day? It's an entirely different place. And the fact of the matter, he had no more idea where Borman was than anybody else. But he was, uh, he would, was flamboyant. He would say anything that got anybody's attention. And he was very anxious to be interviewed because it gave him time out of a cell. But the most significant experience I had at Nuremberg was a, a, an interrogation of Yalmar Schacht. And again, we spoke in English. And towards the end of the conversation, I said, Dr. Schacht, if you had to put your finger on the single most important event that brought about World War II, what would it be? Uh, I said, the Munich Agreement of 1938. And I said, how so? Would you develop that? Well, he said, you may not believe this, but there was a conspiracy in 1938 against Hitler. And we were having a meeting in the office of the Commander-in-Chief, von Brockage. Now, we weren't against war per se, but we were against war at this particular time because we didn't feel we were ready. And when Brokic was about to go out of his office and go over to the Reich's chancellery and tell Hitler he had to resign. And just as he was about to do so, his aide de camp came in. He said, Oh, Herr Feldmarschall, would you please listen to the German radio? There's an important announcement coming over. And he said, We sat there stunned as we heard that Premier Deladier was flying from Paris. Prime Minister Chamberlain was flying from London, and they were going to negotiate with the Fuhrer over the Sudetenland. We knew what that meant. We know that, that the Allies, who we could not believe, would capitulate and sell the Czechs out. The Czechs, he said, had this uh, giant Skoda munitions work in the Sudetenland. They had the finest army in Europe. We could not believe what the Allies did. He said, you haven't heard the end of this. The circle has not yet closed. But when a short, within a short time, the Russians will make their move in Czechoslovakia. And you have so broken the spirit of the Czechs that there will be no resistance. And he said, mark my words, and it later developed. That circle closed. The Munich Agreement of 1938. Um, I think we've arrived at the time when we should say that uh, you're on free time, and there's a social hour at five, and please be back for dinner at <laughs> No, I, I think we have to, we're pretty well over time here.
And uh, I'm sorry, but I think there, uh, there's, I'm sure a lot of people would like to say a thing or two, but I'd like to follow the schedule a little bit. We're one half hour over now. So we're on the social hour, and uh, see you here at dinner at 6.15. Uh, this is a very serious announcement. Uh, I'm talking about the Holocaust tour tomorrow morning. You must be at the Holocaust 15th Street entrance by quarter to ten. Flora Singer, who's been here for a long time. Flora, are you back there? Can you stand up? She's very petite. She will meet you there and take you in to the auditorium. And the name of the auditorium is the Rubenstein Theater. Sybil Milton, who is one of the heads of the Holocaust Museum, will give you a brief intro to the museum, and then Flora and a number of other people, I guess, will take you on through the museum. Uh, certainly, you can leave the tour at any time. That's not a problem. But you ought to allow minimally an hour and a half to see much of anything. There are places to sit down, and if you need a wheelchair, I'm sure that can be provided. Okay, they're available. Uh, and they can check their coats. What about suitcases? Perfect. So if you want to take your suitcases and leave from there. Now my other caution is the taxi cab situation. Taxi cab drivers in Washington are extremely independent. <laughs> you have a sheet, a green sheet in your packet, which tells you that a zone charge, we do not have meters in the district, the zone charge is approximately whatever I said it was, but sometimes that varies by individual driver. There is always an extra charge past the first passenger, so don't forget that either. You need to allow 15 minutes at a minimum to go to the museum from this hotel, and um, I would say that it might be advisable not to depend on that calling the yellow cab, but to depend on the doorman. They do know we're going to need cabs in the morning, but each individual group needs to order up, okay? That's uh, all about the Holocaust Museum. Tickets? Oh, is there a problem getting uh, in? There's no problem getting in. They know you're coming, they're expecting you, and Flora will handle all the details. She has the reservations, so it's not a problem. Approximately 50 people, but they can probably accommodate more if they want to go. Any questions before I go on to something else? Well, the actual address is 100 Raoul Wallenberg Place, Southwest, but you want the 15th Street entrance. And if for any reason you get caught up, say you're with a special group and that you have to go to the Rudenstein Theater, okay? Any questions back there? Flora? Oh yeah, would you wear your name tag so they, they really can see you and know who you are? Um, one other little thing I wanted to tell you. Uh, Drex and I had a real treat last night. Jane Lester, who has come to us from Germany, brought us a beautiful book that she's had published with sayings and anecdotes uh, from Robert Kempner. I know many of you remember Robert. The book is not for sale at this time, but we will try to let you know where you can write to us or write to Jane. She's in the directory if you'd like to see a copy of that. Okay? That's all from me. Now one more. Wow. Oh, I'm sorry. Ted Fenstermacher has lost his glasses. All of us who wear glasses know what that means. If you find his glasses, what do you want them to do, Ted? Turn them into the front desk? $20 reward. <laughs> $20 reward. Yeah. Big time. Ted? And uh, it would have been good to have him talk to us at this time. Um, one of the main things that we did at the last reunion, <coughs> which we'd like to do now, 
is to recognize a number of you, in fact, is all of you almost, in one way or another. But to recognize you mainly in terms of the groups that you uh, were with or the functions you served when you were in, in Nuremberg. And uh, uh, we won't have any talks. We'll just, as you feel, react as we uh, talk about some of these people. I do want to begin by saying that uh, one reason we can all get together here is because of the directory which was created largely by the work of Bobby Hardy. And uh, I know a number of you, have, uh, over a hundred of you, have ordered copies of that all together. And we're very pleased about that. Uh, Bobby was assisted uh, by Clifford Young, who had great capacity in finding people, uh, one way or another. Yeah. You've already uh, talked about the Den Mother, or applauded the Den Mother, so I won't mention that I am very much uh, indebted to, because this really couldn't have all been put off about the work that Virginia has done. Uh, a number of people cared enough about coming. Thank you. <laughs> a number of people cared enough about coming to join us, so they traveled all the way from Europe, and I'd like to have all of them stand at this time, and uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> and uh, I think that the, the persons from Europe uh, were all done as far as uh, distance is concerned by um, Siegfried Rammler. Siegfried, yeah. where are you? Yeah. 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 I'd like to recognize people here that were in the first Nuremberg trial uh, by categories. In the first place, um, who or which of you were research analysts during the first trial? Would you stand? There's all the stones for you. And uh, were there any interrogators? Are there any interrogators here? Which? Dick Dillman? translators in the sense of getting those important documents ready for the trial. Stand 
Yeah, and the assistant uh, secretaries, is that what you're getting at, Jane? Uh, no, I wanted to say that Mrs. Betty Richardson Newt found perhaps the most, <laughs> most important document of all, the Englerism, on which so many uh, proofs were based. She is here. Well, well. Thank you. Thank you. Interpreters. Interpreters. Interpreters in the trial, yes. Other support personnel of any kind from the first trial that hasn't been mentioned. Internal, internal security. Internal security. Good. Any others? I beg your pardon. Oh, yes. And as you know, Ms. Pendridge came all the way from Israel to come to this uh, meeting. And uh, are there any journalists or people that worked with journalists here in the first trial? Anybody else from the first trial? Yeah. Over there. The lawyers, I think we've mentioned, right? Yeah. 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 Right. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else from the first trial? Uh, Benny, let's take it easy. <laughs> yes. Lawrence? Lawrence? Were you photographic ed evidence? Lawrence Reed, photographic evidence. Well, then let's go to the later trials. Oh, wait a minute. Two of us from the proceedings, the 42 volumes uh, on the proceedings of the first trial. Uh, Mildred Clark is here somewhere. In my <laughs> now, if any, the rest of you have any ideas, <laughs> a lot of people I've missed, no. by, please stand. medical case, and uh, would any of you who are working on the medical case please stand up. <laughs> we, we, we've already heard something from the milk case, but I think we better have uh, Henry stand up. <laughs> any others from the milk case? Dave Chuck and Bobby Hardy. Where's Bobby? Bobby Hardy and Kate Tuck. And Jim Conway. Definitely. Yeah. Jim, stand up. The uh, third case was the justice case. Uh, how many of you were on the staff and worked with the justice case? <laughs> Uh, how about the poll case? Anybody who's working on the poll case? <laughs> and let me just go down the other FS cases. The Rusha case. <laughs> I 
I think that I, I think that we come to the Einzach scoop in case and we know who will all stand up on that. Very good. <laughs> Um, on the industrialist cases, I know there's at least one man in here who is on the industrial, on the flick case. Anybody else on the flick case besides Dick Langdale? And on the uh, IP Farben case. <laughs> And on the Cook case. Um, uh, better take the Ministries case, because I think a large number of you worked on that. Ministries case? <laughs> Yes, I am. I am. Bill Jane Lester worked on that too, with Bob Kempner. Um, uh, coming to the military cases, the Southeast case? Helper Taylor and I. Yeah. <laughs> Any others? Colonel Staff and High Command case. <laughs> Um, <laughs> now, I, I'll ask about others that were translators in the later division, but, uh, in the later trials. And interpreters in the Nuremberg uh, and the subsequent proceedings. Those of you who were in any of the support functions in the uh, first, in the subsequent trials, that helped us put the thing over. Court reporters. Court reporters. Court reporters. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How about secretaries in the subsequent trials? Then we had uh, a cafeteria, and we had various support personnel. Uh, let us just have you stand, those of you that worked in any of those Dick support functions. Yeah. Is there anybody else that should be recognized? Uh, who here worked on the publications uh, along with me? <laughs> I understand that Aja Smith is here. <laughs> I understand that Aja Smith is here, the 11 year old lady that came to save the trial. Here she is back there. Oh, I see. <laughs> Well, I think that Whitney Harris should be called on now to make this statement concerning Justice Jackson. Let me, before Whitney gets up here, just say one thing. We have been videotaping these proceedings. If they turn out 
Um, we'd be happy to dub and send to you, provided you write to us and say you're interested. <laughs> so I'm not going to mail to the entire list. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think Telford Taylor has had as much exercise in the last week as he's had tonight. <laughs> you know, it is really a wonderful thing for us to be here together, this group of men and women, most of whom spent a year or more of their lives at Nuremberg. 50 years ago, and all of us had equal parts in that proceeding, it would have been absolutely impossible for that trial and the subsequent proceedings to take place if we had not had those absolutely marvelous interpreters. You all remember the red lights on the podium and on the judge's bench and at the witness box warning us uh, not to speak too fast. The in interpreters were getting behind and all. What would we have done without those interpreters? The trial simply could not have taken place in the time that we, that we had. And uh, I know that those of us who are lawyers all feel extremely humble to be here in this company and to remember the tremendous contribution that everyone made to that, to that great event in our lives. Uh, Drexel has asked me to uh, speak tonight about uh, one of our great leaders at that trial, Justice Jackson, uh, after which he's going to uh, speak about another one of our great leaders Telford Taylor. Mr. Justice Robert H. Jackson had four distinct legal careers, attaining high distinction in all of them. For 21 years, he was active in the practice of law in Western New York, respected by the bar and engaged in useful public service, including membership on the New York Commission on the Administration of Justice. In 1934, when he was 42 years old, he accepted appointment as general counsel of the Bureau of Internal Revenue and for the next seven years pursued his second career as one of the principal law officers of the United States. He became assistant attorney general in 1936 and solicitor general in 1938. He was appointed attorney general of the United States on January 16, 1940, after the outbreak of World War II, but before our actual involvement in it. On August 27, 1940, he advised President Roosevelt that the United States could legally agree with the British government to exchange destroyers and other equipment for naval air and air bases in the Atlantic upon the premise that Hitler was an aggressor, and that Germany was therefore engaged in an illegal war. In reliance upon this opinion, in September 1940, President Roosevelt transferred 40 to 50 destroyers to Great Britain in exchange for leases for naval bases on the Atlantic coast. The Lend-Lease Bill, which was the legal basis for massive material support for Great Britain, was passed in March 1941. Thereafter, in Roosevelt's words, the United States became the arsenal of democracy. Mr. Justice Jackson's third legal career was as an associate member of the Supreme Court of the United States. He was appointed to the court by President Roosevelt in June 1941 and confirmed by the Senate in July. In the words of Harvard professor Arthur E. Sutherland, a summary of his judicial work would require a review of 13 years of the court's history, 
His opinions show his hard common sense, his long and intimate experience with the practical administration of justice, and his sense of tradition, which plays so large a part in our constitutional law. Justice Jackson's fourth legal career was as the United States Chief of Counsel for the prosecution of the major war criminals before the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg from 1945 to 1946. A service not only to our country, but to humanity as well. As the draw, war draw to a, drew to a close, there was uncertainty among the leading powers as to the form of punishment to be inflicted upon Adolf Hitler and the conspirators who were the instigators of World War II and the perpetrators of incredible crimes against humanity in the course of the war. Should they be simply identified and then lined up at dawn and shot, as the British seemed to favor, or should they be hung after a show trial, as the Russians had put on at Kharkov in December 1943? Justice Jackson would have neither. If the German fascists were to be punished, it would have to be after a trial conforming to recognized principles of fairness and justice. On April 13, 1941, in an address to the American Society of International Law, he said, the ultimate principle is that you must put no man on trial under the form of judicial proceedings if you are not willing to see him free, if not proved guilty. If you are determined to execute a man in any case, there is no occasion for a trial. The world yields no respect to courts that are merely organized to convict. A few days after this speech, Justice Jackson received a call from Judge Samuel Rosenman requiring whether he would consider accepting the role of Chief Prosecutor for the United States in a trial of the leading Nazi war criminals. He responded to the inquiry by a memorandum to President Truman in which he declared his willingness to prepare and present the case against war criminals to a United Nations military tribunal. The 1994-45 term of the Supreme Court was drawing to a close, and Justice Jackson believed that he could undertake this special assignment without prejudice to his judicial obligations. As it turned out, the service to his country kept him from the 1945-46 term of the court and may have cost him the Chief Justice here. Justice Jackson took leave of the court pursuant to an executive order of May 8, 1945 to accept the appointment by President Harry Truman as the representative of the United States and as its Chief of Counsel in preparing and prosecuting charges of atrocities and war crimes against such of the leaders of the European Axis powers and their principal agents and accessories as the United States may agree with any of the United Nations to bring to trial before an international military tribunal. Thus began a period of agonizing effort and scintillating achievement that caused Justice Jackson to conclude his introduction to tyranny on trial that the hard months at Nuremberg were well spent in the most important, endearing, and constructive work of my life. On June 6, 1945, Justice Jackson submitted a formal report to President Truman describing the American plan of prosecution. Our case against the major defendants is concerned with a Nazi master plan not with individual barbar barbarities and perversions which occurred independently of any central plan. The groundwork of our case must be factually authentic and to constitute a well-documented history of what we are convinced was a grand concerted pattern to incite and commit the aggressions and barbarities which have shocked the world. We must establish incredible events by credible evidence. Justice Jackson met with representatives of Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union in London 
for the purpose of drafting an agreement for the trial of leading German war criminals and a charter setting forth both the law under which they would be tried. He was determined that the charter should declare that initiating and waging aggressive war is a crime for which responsible heads of state may be held personally liable. He argued, the thing that led us to take sides in this war was that we regarded Germany's resort to war as illegal from the outset, as an illegitimate attack on the international peace and order. This issue was of such supreme importance that Justice Jackson was prepared to forego the trial rather than to surrender it. He declared, we want this group of nations to stand up and say that launching a war of aggression is a crime and that no political or economic situation can justify it. Justice Jackson's argument prevailed, and in the final draft of the Charter, the planning, preparation, initiation, or waging of a war of aggression was declared to be criminal. The remaining task was to persuade the tribunal to advance the international law of crimes by finding the accomplices of the tyrant Adolf Hitler guilty of this crime. There is no need to repeat before this audience so sophisticated in the Nuremberg proceedings, the monumental contribution of Justice Jackson in organizing and directing the American prosecution at Nuremberg. The task facing him was staggering. He had to obtain the agreement of the Allies to a military trial, negotiate with them the organization, jurisdiction, and procedure of the tribunal join with them in the identification of the persons to be accused and prepare suitable indictments, find a site for the trial, see to the availability of a court, prison, and other facilities, supervise the housing and feeding of lawyers and others participating in the trial, select the members of his legal staff, and personally conduct and direct the prosecution of the case on behalf of the United States. With characteristic drive and enthusiasm, Justice Jackson set about promptly to overcome all obstacles and achieve a fair trial of the hated leaders of Nazi Germany. His opening speech to the tribunal has been repeatedly acknowledged as a forensic masterpiece. He closed that speech with these words. It is not necessary among the ruins of this ancient and beautiful city, with untold numbers of its civilian inhabitants still buried in its rubble, to argue the proposition that to start an aggressive war has the moral qualities of the worst of crimes. The refuge of the defendants can be only their hope that international law will lag so far behind the moral sense of mankind that conduct, which is a crime in the moral sense, must be regarded as innocent in law. Civilization asks whether law is so laggard as to be utterly helpless to deal with crimes of this magnitude by criminals of this order of importance. It does not expect that you can make war impossible. It does expect that your judicial action will put the focus of international law, its precepts, its prohibitions, and most of all, its sanctions, on the side of peace, so that men and women of goodwill in all countries may have leave to live by no man's leave underneath the law. Justice Jackson's decision that the American case should be primarily documentary led to the introduction of German orders and decrees establishing irrefutably the massive crimes charged in the indictment. In his closing speech, Justice Jackson <coughs> recited the role of each defendant in the conspiracy. He concluded his summation with this peroration. It is against such a background that these defendants now ask this tribunal to say that they are not guilty of planning, executing, 
or conspiring to commit this long list of crimes and wrongs. They stand before the record of this trial as blood-stained Gloucester stood by the body of his slain king. He begged of the widow, as they beg of you, say, I slew them not. And the queen replied, then say they were not slain, but dead they are. If you were to say of these men that they are not guilty, it would be as true to say that there has been no war, there are no slain, there has been no crime. In its judgment, the tribunal held individual defendants guilty of committing massive war crimes and crimes against humanity. In addition, it upheld the proposition that to initiate and wage aggressive war is criminal in international law, and that individuals who make the political decisions for aggression may be held personally accountable for this crime. War is essentially an evil thing, the tribunal said. The consequences are not confined to the belligerent states alone, but affect the whole world. To initiate a war of aggression, therefore, is not only an international crime, it is the supreme international crime, differing only from other war crimes in that it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole. This principle, set out in the Charter and confirmed and applied by the Tribunal, was Jackson's crowning contribution to international law at Nuremberg. Never before had any man been held guilty of the crime of waging aggressive war. Since Nuremberg, no man can claim ignorance of this crime. In his final address to the Tribunal, Justice Jackson prophesied, it is common to think of our own time as standing at the apex of civilization from which the deficiencies of preceding ages may be patronizingly viewed in the light of what is assumed to be progress. The reality is that in the long perspective of history, the present century will not hold an admirable position unless its second half is to redeem its first. These two score years in the 20th century will be recorded in the Book of Years as one of the most bloody in all annals. If we cannot eliminate the causes and prevent the repetition of these barbaric events, it is not an irresponsible prophecy to say that this 20th century may yet succeed in bringing the doom of civilization. We are but four years now from the end of the 20th century. Despite repeated acts of aggression and the commission of war and humanitarian crimes since Nuremberg, the prospect that the century will end in peace through enforcement of the principles proposed by Justice Jackson and adopted by the International Military Tribunal is now a virtual certainty. At century's end, the Nuremberg precedent is being applied to the war crimes tribunals established by the Security Council for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Judge Richard Goldstone, the chief prosecutor for these tribunals, said recently, one of the beacons to shine out of the 20th century is the trial of the major war criminals at Nuremberg. That trial and the principles of law which it produced was the achievement, more than any other man, of Justice Robert H. Jackson. It will long emblazon the aspirations of man for peace. Justice Jackson died at 11.45 a.m. October 9, 1954, in Washington after being stricken by a heart attack. He was only 62 years of age. He had already contributed significantly to the progress of law and justice in the United States through three careers. In his fourth career, as the United States Chief of Counsel before the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg, 
case contributed more than any other person in this century to the advancement of the international law of crimes and the cause of world peace under law. Jackson was appointed U.S. Chief of Council. He got the War Department to send a message to England to say that he wished Alfred Taylor to be returned to the United States directly. Uh, at that time, Alfred Taylor had been serving with a, a joint British-American intelligence group in Bletchley. Within a week or two after he had returned to the United States, he wrote a memorandum, of which I have a copy. It's called An Approach to the Preparation of the Prosecution of Access Criminality. This memorandum he wrote for Justice Jackson, and it had its influence upon some of the writings of Justice Jackson uh, shortly thereafter, if you were to compare some of the phrases. After the, after the trial got underway, Justice Jackson decided rather promptly, if he hadn't even before the trial started, that if there were to be subsequent trials, he wanted Telford Taylor to be his successor. Um, some of you will remember that during the first trial, uh, Telford Taylor made the presentation in the case against the general staff and high command case. I think that there was no presentation that was made in that first trial uh, against any organization which uh, equaled that presentation. Two months after that presentation, Justice Jackson named Colonel Taylor as Deputy Chief Counsel, and he formally assigned him the responsibility for organizing and planning the prosecution of further war crimes trials. Colonel Taylor was promoted to be a Brigadier General, and shortly, within days after the IMT trial, the commander of the U.S. military forces in the European theater named him to be the U.S. Chief of Counsel for War Crimes. General Taylor served in that capacity for nearly three years. The complexity of the task of managing the prosecution staff at Nuremberg can hardly be comprehended by persons who are not there. This is partly indicated, I think, if you just think of some of the things which had to be managed and which had to be uh, coordinated together. There was an evidence division, an interrogation branch, a document control branch, uh, the language division overall, a personnel division, central library, a cafeteria division. <laughs> then there were these, the various trial groups the SS Division, the Military Division, the Ministries Division, the Economics Division, and then people who had worked in these general areas were split off to work on the various trial teams for each of the 12 cases. Uh, toward the end, he established a Publications Division, and uh, uh, I should mention also that there was, of course, a public relations branch uh, at uh, the trial. All of these branches with their many functions 
contributed greatly to the legacy of Nuremberg. And that legacy depended a great deal upon the wisdom, the vision, the organizational capacity, and the eloquence of Telford Taylor. Speaking, speaking of his capacity for expression, I will not quote some of the